next I will uh, call upon uh, Dr. B. R.K. Pillai uh, uh, to come forward and uh, present. Taken for uh, today's discussion is paradigm shift in dam safety. But I think most of the job already has been done by uh, Dr. M. S. Reddy. Uh, he was also basically talking about the paradigm shift and unfortunately, sir, I'm only going to repeat what you said, maybe with a different uh, style, but that's all I'm going to talk about. So please bear with me if something looks like repetitive, but even if we make it 10 times repeat, probably the emphasis still will continue. So with that, I'll just take you through my scheme of presentations. I don't have many slides, but I may need a little more time. Uh, basically, I'm going to talk about the dam safety professionals, that is the paradigm shift in dam safety professionals, the shift in the dam owning entities, the organizations where we are actually working, a shift in terms of the use or usage or the level of technology and innovations, and of course, a need for bringing a stakeholder orientation. So these are the areas which I'll pick up one by one, but before that, let me take uh, uh, you through this basic understanding that why do we need to have a paradigm shift? Okay, basically these are the only reasons why we have to have a paradigm shift. But then these reasons in itself are not so insignificant. One is that we have the aging dam infrastructure. We already know that about 80% of our dam have already surpassed the age of 25 years. You know most of the dams were built before 1970, almost 50% of the dams were built before 1970. That means by 2020, this 50% of the dam are going to be 50 year old. And out of the remaining 50%, nearly all of them, nearly all of them were completed by say around 1990. Very few dams started happening after that. What it means is, add another 20 years, 100% of the dams are going to fall in the basket <coughs> of 50 year age category. And those 50 percent will shift to something like 70 year age category. Now that kind of a aging infrastructure should ring some kind of an alarm bell. And this is going to, you know, escalate in a very, very steep manner. Second is the factor of climate change. You know, every model which we have been talking about today, they may have all kind of a, a kind of a uh, disagreement on some kind of a values. But one factor which comes out very clearly is that the extreme events, are going to increase in terms of frequency and as well as in terms of the extreme values. It has only one indication that it is of a concern to the dam safety. Water availability probably may not shift overall, but the hazard potential is going to increase, especially from the point of view of dam safety. And third is, of course, the fact that we are continuously increasing in terms of population. This population density as such is going up and we are coming very, very close to the dam. In fact, if you look at the Idiki dam, probably the habitat is just at the toe of the dam. And that's the, that's the case with most of the dam now. And the population is continuing to grow. I mean, till 1950 probably we will be stabilizing. So what is the kind of scenario? If one of our dam fails, we are not talking of one or two people. Maybe we are talking of 100, to maybe 1000 and maybe a lack of people who are likely to be affected. And that applies to the economics also. If a railway line is washed, if a if a industry itself gets affected, that's a huge economy. I mean, the economic value of the infrastructure which is going to be affected, even if we evacuate the people, but still probably you will be suffering in terms of economic loss. And there is a huge potential to the environmental also. In fact, I would like to underline this fact that if you try to look back at any forest reserve, probably you will find that it is in one of the reservoir, a dam reservoir area. If a dam fails, it's not simply the water flows. It's a huge amount of debris, the sludge which goes. And probably the whole stretch, you will have to abandon because it's not something that you can easily go and start removing that. It has a huge environmental impact. And over and above, there is a shift in the sensitivity of the people. If you look at the case of Mullah Periyar Dam, it's not that there was a kind of make-believe thing which was happening. People were really, really concerned. I mean, somewhere we, have, we failed to connect with the people, but the shift, the concern which they had about their threat to their life 
that is something is not very easy to explain a scenario may come which will go totally out of the control if we don't do something about this it will definitely have political consequences but it can have some consequences which may have much deeper in impact as far as the national <laughs> framework is concerned so having said that i'll take you to one by one of these four points where i'm talking about a shift i'll start from the uh, bottom one i'll talk about the stakeholder orientation just before this session there was a mention on the large dam incidents the upper slide is basically showing those boys and girls who got trapped it's actually there are much more gruesome photographs obviously i would not be showing that but this also i feel a little uh, you know not confident enough to put this kind of a slide where boys and girls are about to drown and the slide below the photograph below is of the chennai hospital where 17 people died simply because their generator chamber got flooded because of release from a dam the point is here that these incidents happened and we simply blame as though it's a it's a, it's a act of god it is not and for a long time we are not able to even connect with that what has happened it has nothing to do with them that's how we are thinking we think that everything was rightly done as far as the dam is concerned our focus is on the dam not on the people the real stakeholder orientation is just not there it's not that in case of chennai the operation plan was not there what they call as the rule curve was very much there for the dam but then it was not implemented or we had a reason to keep on passing it on to some other level and some other level that means somewhere we are not willing to understand that what that regulation or the rule curve is meant for and same is the case with largely i mean if you say that uh, uh alarm was not there it was there but it was not working or maybe it was not upgraded to a higher level as our uh, previous speaker was saying but the fact is there is a lot to change in terms of our orientation as far as the stakeholders are concerned for whom we are talking about this dam safety in fact there are three levels if you look at the stakeholder model relationship there are only three levels but when it comes to dam safety i thought that's not going to work there is one more significant level which is the uninformed level and we actually are standing in that level that is we are in the uninformed category you know sometime back when they used to make railway uh, uh, railway lines they never thought of that elephant is a stakeholder till it became a threat not only to the elephant but to the passengers that we started thinking about putting the, having the need for the elephant corridor and that's how the whole idea came they were able to move from the uninformed category to a higher category but we are still not able to move as though this is a much more serious issue but we are not able to shift ourselves from the level of un uninformed category to a higher level of stakeholder relationship the next level is compliant level which is where it comes out of regulation by the statutory mechanism if the dam safety bill would have been there probably we would have already moved to the compliant level but having a bill is just like having a traffic light if people don't follow it has no meaning so compliant as such is not going to make the difference actually it's again your orientation which has to go really up that is the level where we become responsive a drip project was actually meant to take you from the uninformed category to the responsive category because somewhere we got stuck up with the compliance level and i tell you this journey towards the responsive stage is actually working i mean this kind of a conference itself is a journey towards that responsive stage but there is a lot to do on that and the final stage will be what we call as the engaged now the engaged relationship is where the change is happened at the stakeholder level also it's not only a change in us but a change in the target group also if you want to understand that you have to only look at this uh, which was already mentioned also that urubili dam in the california just last sunday dr reddy mentioned 1.8 lakh people something like 2 lakh people were asked to evacuate with a notice of something like 20 to 30 minutes response time and they evacuated that is the level of engagement the stakeholders are engaged they did not question you in fact the authority was saying you please please this is not a mock drill this is a real threat please evacuate it also shows that they had a system of mock drill in place maybe they have been doing for decades together and now the event happened so that is the level of stakeholder engagement that is what we need to go for i know sir there may be shortage of time but please permit me to close this 
Okay, coming on the technology and innovation. At the age of dawn, probably we cannot afford to fight our, our battle with the tools of bows and arrows. There is a lot there which is available in terms of technology. In fact, adoption of technology itself has become so simple simply because of the way the technology has come up. It has got its own strength in its, in its uh, capacity to make it available. If the smartphone can be used by every, every person in this uh, say country, even the rickshawala or a vegetable vendor or a fisherman is able to use that smartphone, why do we think that we cannot use the smart technology for our own dam when we are so educated and so advanced in every respect? It doesn't happen because we have a, a kind of a resistance towards innovativeness to, towards something new. There is a huge inertia which is there. And it's not because of the government framework. That's secondary. Government framework really doesn't stop you. But somewhere some kind of a fear, some kind of a you know, business as usual attitude which is coming in the way. The areas which can be touched with new technologies, investigations, design and analysis, material, methodology. I mean, today again, we, if we have to go for a drilling, we are still talking about drilling from the top of the dam. Whereas investigation tells you exactly which are the pockets where you have the issue of low density. It's possible to have a uh, directional drilling and you can approach, approach that very point and do what kind of uh, the point treatment. Instead of that, we are still going ahead with the mass drilling, filling up the uh, drill holes and grouting and grouting. These are the areas which definitely can be changed with the technology which is available. Instrumentation, there is a lot to. Uh, we have the fiber optics, uh, if you look at uh, the stall which is there, almost every issue of instrumentation the fiber optics is apparently sufficient, but we have not used. In terms of data management, there is nothing much to say. Everyone understands that. So I will go to the next one, please. Coming on the dam owning entity, that is the nature of the ownership of the dam. That's also very important. We cannot continue to work in the department mode. The simple reason is there is no value to the money if it is in the department mode. Even when we are borrowing money from the World Bank, as far as our books of record goes, the cost incurred on the dam is only that value which has gone through the contract. That is the only value which we, we add as the cost of the dam. But ask UJVML, it will be different for them. Even the interest which we are, they are going to pay will go into the entry of the same dam cost. They understand the value of the money. They can correlate that value of the money in terms of generations also, the cost recovery also. Like we paid money for their power, Chilla Powerhouse, which you have recently visited. The Chilla Powerhouse channel repair was able to allow them to save water to generate more power. And they can actually give you the cost economics in terms of the profit which they made out of it, which probably we cannot do in, in our conventional approach. Only a company firm can allow that. Then we need to convert our dam and reservoir as a, as a separate utility to bring focus on the dam. If our power generation reform, if you look at the converted generation unit, transmission unit and distribution unit, why we cannot have our water resource also converted into dam and reservoir utility, a, trans, a canal and main canal and branch canal system and a distribution system. Let them work in their own compartment. Let the efficiency or inefficiency of the system be known there. We say only 40% of the water is actually reaching that tail end or the, or the command area. Where is this water going? Is it the fault of the dam? In fact, let me tell you one example. Somewhere in Maharashtra, one guy has put 5 kilometer pipeline in three different fields. Means he had three pipelines, 5 kilometer each. But the source of water was one small plot and he was taking the groundwater only. And where is this plot located? Adjacent to a reservoir. And if you ask this guy what happens when the reservoir goes down, he says my water stops. And if I ask him if this reservoir would not have been there, will you, would you have invested this much? He said no, no way. It's only the dam which has become the groundwater and he is using this groundwater. So can we say that our dams are having inefficiency when we make a claim that the cost of the dams are going like this and this and why to put money on investment? It's the groundwater also which is actually taking the water from the same dam. So we need to convert this 
our utilities into profit center concept. So even if it's a notional value, please attach that value and bring that into the cost economics so that you can justify the reason why we need to invest so much in our assets which are going to last maybe another 100 or maybe 200 or maybe 1000 years. And of course, we need to go for the innovative funding. Mere collection of money is not going to happen, but there is a lot of money in our dams. The simple point is the tourism. You know the word Apsara, the Aps word in Apsara stands for water. The beautiful names of the heaven, the Apsaras, are nothing but the water element. And our water reservoirs can prove you, you just go and stand, I can challenge anybody that the most beautiful spot in your life, you will say this is that. Such beautiful spots cannot be converted into tourism. We have tourism, but they are the tourism on the downstream of the dam. Even KRS dam, you are only seeing the downstream. You are not seeing the water. You are not seeing the apsara. We have to shift. And there is money in it. All the islands which are there, Hirakut has got so many beautiful islands that can be converted into PPP mode. There is huge money available there. But then we have to take the decision. Please conclude. Uh, yeah, please, sir. Fisheries, if you look at the US, there is so much of protein, so much of business from each reservoir. This uh, dam failure, the last week's, uh, uh, when we said they displaced 2 lakh people, they also displaced 5 million baby fishes from the hatcheries. They relocated them because of this single incidence. Because those 5 million fisheries are money for them. So there is money for fisheries. And there are a lot of other possibilities which I need not elaborate. I'll come to the last point. Yeah, that's what Dr. Reddy kept on saying. That the, what is it we are talking about the dam safety? It's nothing to do, do with dam safety. It's all about the people. Somewhere we are actually be fooling us. We are not honest to ourselves. When Dr. Reddy says that if he tells why you know this problem, why you are not able to solve it, there is no answer. Somewhere we are able to find reasons why it cannot be done. And in India, you can always find a reason why it cannot be done. It's a very convenient thing. People are just not taking decisions or taking responsibility at the level where it can be resolved. They just pass it on to a higher and a higher and a higher level and a level where they have no idea about the problem and then we blame that level. Somewhere we need to change that. Uh, sir, I would quote Gita again. I mean, you have been quoting Gita. I also would like to quote it, sir. Krishna did say to Arjuna, Sanshyatma Vinashyati. It means if you become indecisive, you are bound to get destroyed. Sanshya here is not doubt. In every as action of damn safety, we work with probability. That means we have doubt. But we should not become indecisive. If Hira could flood, design flood has exceeded, where is the question of remaining indecisive? Konar Dam, we have the cracks for last 60 odd years, we are indecisive what to do about it. In fact, every dam, Chanpata Dam, he mentioned, take any dam, Tigra Dam, sir, next to Chanpata, is similar situation, KRS Dam, similar situation. It's not that those problems could not have been resolved, no, it was sheer indecisiveness. What happens if a doctor at the operating table becomes indecisive? There is only the life of one person, but here as dam operator, we are indecisive, affecting the lives of maybe thousands of people. And finally, knowledge and experience. Okay, knowledge is something which we all understand, but experience is very different. If you have a success story, it gives you confidence. But if you have a failed story, it gives you a learning curve. And unfortunately, we don't have a failed story. Somewhere we are so comfortable with saying everything is good, everything is good, and we don't have a failed case. In fact, it's hardly you can come across a literature which says, okay, this was done and we failed. Then where is the learning curve? We don't have a learning curve. Uh, something somebody mentioned about uh, that emergency action, I mean, the dam break analysis, we don't have a guidelines to decide about the breach parameters. We are using the parameters from international practices, but we have 5,000 dam and we don't have a single breach parameter of our own because our dams don't fail. I mean, if you want to believe so, well and good. Our dams fail, but we don't want to believe that they fail. We don't want to record, we don't want to investigate, and we don't want to learn anything out of it. 
So we have knowledge, a lot of knowledge, but we don't have experience. We are engineers. But then we are too much of engineers. There's a lot of issues which we can understand by being more practical about it. The designers, they make things which are impossible to put into practice. Even the methodologies of implementations, if you look, I mean, la, la, last time which I visited was, they were doing the uh, surface treatment, and obviously they did the surface treatment from the bottom, and the flood season came, and the dam is reached to the FRL level. So what happens to the surface treatment which you have done? The whole water in any case has gone into the dam, the dam is saturated, water level will go down, the saturation will operate like a head, and whatever you have done, the treatment will come out. These are the things which we sometimes do not even give consideration to think. There are so many cases, of course, Dr. Reddy, I mean, you sir mentioned about the need to bring this knowledge into some kind of a documentation, but more than documentation, probably more interaction is what we need, sir. Uh, so last one, last one, sir. The drip which we have been talking about, dam rehabilitation and improvement project, has one more mandate. We have been trying to change everything as far as the external intake is concerned. We have been trying to do everything, right from the guidelines to training to everything. But right from the beginning, we also talked about a change inside our own self. That is a change which was focused inward. And those people who have been going through the DRIP training program, they know that DRIP is also defined as dignity, responsibility, integrity, and professionalism. If these things do not make a difference to us, nothing external is going to make a difference to us. And all these parameters are internal. Dignity is different from pride. It has nothing. Most dignified professions are the teaching and the medicine professions. And I will rate this as higher than medicine because we are not dealing with one or two people, but the safety of many, many people. Responsibility is more of response rather than the ability. You can get ability by training and knowledge, but the response has to come right from inside. Integrity is not about corruption or the what we have been trying to understand. The whole India has become honest when the demonetization happened. I'm not talking about that corruption or honesty. Integrity is about our capacity to work as a single entity, to have a unity, the yoke within ourselves. And professionalism is something which probably nobody can define because it goes even above the nationalism. It's your commitment which you made when you passed out and you took a oath. That's all professionalism is all about. Uh, with that, sir, my slide has come to end. Just before I conclude, I would like to make one statement here. The, the most renowned dam safety expert, which I have come to understand, is a boy, a child of 12 year old. His name is David. It's in the past. We know the story. I have read the story when, right from the childhood that somewhere in Holland when that dike was about to breach, this boy came and put his finger and he sat there throughout the night to save the lives of the people, the whole village is downstream of the dike. We all know this story about a brave child, but it has nothing to do with the bravery. It is something to do with the awareness. Awareness which is coming from outside but which was internalized by the same child. And that made him dam safety expert. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Mark Safe. So dam safety is indirectly is a people safety. So to protect the people, so is what I suggest, what I would, would like to suggest is low rain floods should be sensitized for the people on the downstream. In so most of the areas, people are used to think floods come when only rain comes. But because of the operation failures that's happening because of uh, the, uh, the uh, untimely action. We are not taking that, that is causing some operations where you, it is taking away some of the lives of the people downstream. So low rain floods, it should be sensitized to the downstream people. Even if there is no rain, flood may happen, which is because of dams on, on the upstream. So one more thing, sir, I would like to tell <coughs> because before giving a child, birth, birth to a child, our uh, baby's care should be taken from the conception itself. <coughs> Because here, we are producing a dam chain. If it is not taken care, it will kill so many people's lives. So what I feel is dam safety should be there from the conception of the project itself. 
and wherever a water report is made, depends. Any water report, which is there is a possibility of no rain floods, it should have an element of remark under dam safety head. Then only every sector from common man to politicians can understand the importance of dam safety. So I will close with one more thing. Uh, everybody knows. It is as difficult and as easy. The same way dams are actually same as difficult and as easy. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to put one, one small point uh, which I think that uh, it is a relevance. Uh, we need to actually uh, promote dam safety in, in two, two aspects. Uh, one of the aspects is, of course, for, for sensitizing the public where we are creating this kind of a, a worry in the mind of the public that this, is, this dam will fail, you are all going to be wiped out. It's a, it's a kind of creating a fear so that, uh, so that somehow or other uh, you will come down and, and, and uh, give us money or give me the resources from the society side. That, that's one side. But the real important side of their safety is treating their safety as a management discipline. Taking it as a part of the asset management program, understanding the value of the asset, and then based on that value of the asset, based on based on the returns that the asset is producing to you, creating a justification in the mind of the decision makers that the money spent on this is really worth. This is something which we need to do. We can keep on making people afraid. People will be really losing their night's sleep about uh, about the dam failing and all that. But the but the real thing is that look at the situation. A dam which was constructed for hardly some 600 uh, crores would have, have returned to 19,000 crores so far, and then every year it is probably doing it three times the three times its original cost. This is something which is not being understood many times. After having enjoyed the benefits, people have a tendency to look at the dam as a nuisance. Can you believe it? Ukai Dam is considered a nuisance by the people living in Surat who are really not technical people. They don't understand that the whole command area, the revolution of, of, of prosperity that they are seeing in South Gujarat is coming out of the dam. And they are simply worried because sometimes uh, there, will be, there will be flood and, and they are also partly responsible for having a flood in the, in the river bed. So the issue is this, that we need to sensitize at two levels. That first level of sensitization will work up to only a limit. We need not really overemphasize it and we need not really get into that, that bracket. But we must get into the second bracket where we should, we should be able to make sense to the uh, decision makers and, and economics and all those guys who we consider the burden of control of the I am Perumal, Professor in the Department of Biology. And uh, Dr. Pillai has uh, pointed out about uh, the integrity of learning process. The, uh, uh, the thing is that if the lessons learned from the past failures, if it can be put together in one, uh, you know, in volume of volume, and that would be useful for technical institutes who are teaching the course. You know, we are not only meant for group of the developing the engineers, we are also we are also talk about the case studies. What are the failures? He has pointed out that it's not only the successful things we are going to teach. We have to tell the students if there is a failure, then what is going to be the first failure? If you are not going to adopt the design correctly, then what is going to be the consequences? So we should have you know, some place the failure scenarios also. That is not only applicable for dam safety for any other consideration. Just because you have a big project, all the failure cases put together should be available to the public in the public domain. Because what I have learned and I am teaching it. I have got the fortunate opportunity to work for the Machutu to a dam failure. So I am teaching that one. But what about the rest of the failures? what we have learned from that one. And also the other thing is that whatever has happened to Machu too, I know I have gone through the entire commission report and in that it is stated the engineer who was looking after the dam, he ran away at the time of the failure because you know there was no information. We were informed by the United States 
that you are time as well, that particular area has been done there. But that scenario should not revive now, because after 40 years, the scenario is taking place in that way, I think that it is not, you know, what to say about that. So I think all the failure scenarios, all the, all the failure cases should have been in one place, it should be available. Especially the great program is there, that it should take this as also a mandate in their... Uh